in progress. Now, something that is not as nice to be motivated for is ESPN's hot seat column, uh, early hot seat column for 2022, uh, which features Mike Norvell. Uh, this is written by ESPN's Adam Rittenberg, uh, who I have a lot of respect for. I think he does his own work. I think he's well-sourced, and I think he generally does a good job of reading the tea leaves in the sport. Uh, I'll also preface this by saying that this is an extremely difficult article to do this early in the year uh, because most athletic departments made their moves last year or last December following uh, a year in which few made moves uh, because it was a pandemic season. So there's a lot of pent up moves that got released in December of 2021. So I don't think you're going to have that many firings this year. But Mike Norvell is listed on the hot seat. Uh, this is year three for him. So I'll just put what, what Adam writes and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll kind of discuss because I, I have some some fairly strong thoughts here. Does it involve Jackson and Jacksonville State? Because I certainly can understand. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to step on his article, but I can understand where a national article or a national writer would come to some conclusions as such. It does. And if I'm the editor at ESPN and you don't put that in there, I'm probably like, what the hell are you doing? Right? It's it's relevant. Um, the ACC projects to be the most active league during the upcoming carousel because Dino Babers and Scott Satterfield and Jeff Collins are also listed. With Mac Brown is, quote, keep an eye on category. Uh, especially if improvement does not take place at several programs. The past cycle included four ACC changes, three firings, and one retirement. That was cut clip at Duke. Uh, and the next one could approach or even exceed the total. Norvell's situation will generate the most national attention as Florida State tries to dig itself out of the mess made towards the end of the Jimbo Fisher tenure. After making the postseason every year from 79 to 17, the Seminoles have missed bowl games in Norvell's first two seasons and three of the past four seasons. Norvell's uh, team responded well from an 0-4 start, winning five of its next seven games before a season-ending loss to Florida. Then came the signing day flip of top recruit Travis Hunter, who chose to play for former FSU star Deion Sanders at Jackson State, which sparked the Fire Mike Norvell Twitter Spaces conversation, which I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't join that, but I, I saw that. Uh, continuing, a third consecutive bowl this year will mean the end for Norvell, but the coach has support from new athletic director Michael Alford and key donors. He will also have more of his players in key roles this fall. The question is how many wins Mike Norvell needs to ensure he's back in 2023. And my answer to that. I don't want to say zero because then weird stuff happens. But I think it's probably like four. If he goes two and 10, I can't tell, I can't sit here and tell you that Mike Norvell is going to be back in 2023. However, I will tell you, and you'll tell me the same thing because we have different guys we talk to, but I'm confident that some of the folks we talk to are some of the absolute biggest, most influential boosters that FSU has. And I had a conversation with a guy the other day who was all in on Mike Norvell. Mike's our guy. That's what he told me. Mike, Mike will, will get this right, and we will give him the time to get it right. And I got to talk to him a little bit. And what I realized here is that during the pandemic, Mike Norvell did not get to go out and do all these booster tour events. He didn't get to go out and speak to the large groups and do the the, the Tampa bar crawl and, and, and the Orlando you know, downtown bar crawl and, and well, bar crawls basically everywhere, right? And, and the golf tournament and the fishing tournament at the Southwest Florida Seminole Club, which is an awesome experience. And I, I hope we have this year. But what he did get to do was meet with the big money folks in small groups because you could still kind of pull that off during COVID. And I'm not here to tell you that Mike Norvell told these guys, hey, we're going to suck or hey, we won't make a bowl. But but I am here to tell you uh, that I think the message got across. The guy I was speaking to was not surprised that they went five and seven at all. And I know you've had similar conversations with people. So it does seem like Norvell accurately assessed the roster he had. And privately, if he didn't tell them, hey, we're going to suck. Hey, we're going to miss bowls. He at least got the message across that it was possible. Because these guys, I, people I know talk to Mike Corvell, they cut the, they cut some of the biggest checks, and they were not surprised at how the season went at all. 
Did you get any different feedback than that recently? Because like that's exactly what I got the other day. Mike Norvell's support uh, amongst the again, I, I don't try to speak for anybody, and I certainly don't claim to know everybody, but my no, but perception has been what you stated. Mike Norvell's support amongst large, significant boosters has been similar to where it was 12 months ago. Now, does that mean that people weren't embarrassed by Jacksonville State? Hell yeah. Does it mean that people weren't pissed off and embarrassed by Jackson State? Ditto. Um, And this isn't like a, oh, look at us, but it's just a point of reflection. We said last year, about eight months ago, that Florida State in-house coaching would take six and six immediately and put that in the bank roll into the recruiting class, think that you kept the vast majority of it, and, you know, roll on Big River from there. And they would have been fine with 6-6. Six and six. Do you remember how much crap we took for saying that? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I don't want to say I don't pay attention to what people say. I do. Um, but I, it doesn't it doesn't look register, at the Apple reviews it when does, said it. It doesn't register with me nearly what it did maybe six or seven years ago. And it doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I don't value people's opinion or whatever else, but I'm, you know, we're not, not going to be swayed by uh, Twitter feedback and, uh, and other things like that. So yeah, I, I remember, I remember people not being happy about it. I remember, and I'm not trying to throw arrows at other people in the media, but I remember other people talking about eight or nine wins and how realistic. Oh, it's funny was to see the be. chart. Remember it was like, okay, January, they're here at nine wins. And then, uh, okay, we're here to February and they're like, ah, I don't know, maybe eight or nine. And then, kind of slowly as as the season got then eventually they kind of met us there right like on, 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 a... on the bench was like hey i think you know six and six five and seven maybe some of the other shows were still a little little with helium not not really being either not being truthful or not not really understanding what they were looking at in practice yeah you know so, I, I will give brendan and those guys credit like they were not blowing smoke again um in house, I think the expectation was a 500 record, and has been for a while. And yeah. our whole point here is that in these small groups, in this two to three meeting at a hunting cabin in the woods, in this four person, you know, setting in a, you know, uh, a nice house in North Georgia or something like that, or South Florida, uh, boosters of significance had a pretty good idea as to what was coming down the tracks. Now, doesn't mean that um, you don't have a new AD, and ultimately Mike and and Mike, we're in many of these meetings that we're referencing right now. And those who have a great, you know, great rapport and respect for each other, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, an AD is going to ultimately want his football program to do uh, as well as it can. And, you know, that's only going to go so long. But uh, for the time being, I agree. I, I We would have to see a, catas- you know, a cataclysmic chain of failure to see Mike Norvell really get a talk, you know, a, a hot seat talk really catch on. Uh, uh, anything other than kind of national media and, and those who uh, would love to believe otherwise. So we'll have to see. I, I think you're right. I think you have to look at a three-win season or worse for there to be real discussion about Mike Norvell's job security. A couple other points I'll add to this. Uh, number one is you, you brought up the point of, of Michael Alford, right, the, the new athletic director. I think he's going to probably want – to really evaluate what they have there. He certainly worked behind the scenes with Mike Corbell, has fundraised with the guy, and I believe is somebody who does genuinely have have, a, have some skin in the game. Pretty tangible the- evidence that he's made funds available for Mike to make some really aggressive hires, which will be, or at least have the opportunity to make some significant hires, which will be kind of where we go next with this. Yeah, um, There's the been other- support given to Mike and, and the addition to go out and try to bolster a staff and Florida state pay is paying very, very competitive uh, for some of these positions that they're trying to fill. Exactly. Right. I mean, we, we, we heard North of 200 for the GM role. Obviously some of the back office guys got tremendous raises, which uh, I mean, who knows? I, I tend to think that they, I, I don't think they were really being targeted elsewhere, but okay. Uh, I want to point out a couple other things too, from a fundraising perspective, it does not make – they are still paying Willie Taggart through the end of 2023. I've been told flat out Florida State is not interested in paying two coaches at the same time to not coach. Okay? So you have that. 
And I believe that person that told me that. Number two, they are trying to finish getting the football-only facility constructed in a reasonable time frame. If you're having to use money to buy somebody out, that's money that's probably not going to the football-only facility. So that's a problem, too, which, again, it's another thing why I'm firmly, firmly of the belief that Mike Norvell is not on the hot seat for 2023, or excuse me, for 2022 at all. Does he have to start showing some progress at some point? Yes. But also, I think that because the big boosters that I talk to are telling me this has gone roughly record-wise how I expected it to go based on my conversations with people, that is in stark contrast to what their expectations were based on the feedback that they got from the staff before Mike Norvell. And that feedback from the staff before Norvell turned out to be way wrong, and it caused them to absolutely lose confidence in that staff quickly. They believe that this staff has accurately evaluated what they have and has accurately communicated to them, this is going to take a while. This is a freaking mess, right? So, well, you know, from that perspective... Let me say one more thing. Also, Has the turnaround been as quickly as anybody wanted to know? Would, would everybody that identifies as a Florida State fan, had wanted to see them sign Travis Hunter? Hell yes. Um, but worst case scenario, let's say Mike Norvell is but a kind of caretaker head coach that transitions you through this time. You're signing pretty decent recruiting classes. You're getting kids in. You're developing, developing them. You're doing well in the portal. I mean, you are incrementally raising the ceiling here and raising the floor. And I know it's not as fast as many would want, uh, but if, worst case scenario, you had to hire Mike for four years, pay him what at this point is not a whole lot of money to be a head coach at a, at Are a football program. Are you under the impression that like the extension State. is not a big money guaranteed extension? Uh, I don't think it is. I don't okay. think it, it necessarily, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's going to drastically reset his place in the ACC pay structure. I'll put it that way. Um This is a hell of a lot better uh, hands to put a program in than somebody that's either going to boom or bust, And in my opinion, for what you need from this program. And I'm not, I don't think Mike's fate has been written by any mean. I just uh, will point out that the downside here is not all that down. I mean, you are incrementally improving your roster. Uh, you've taken concern, you know, not that APR is what it used to be. Uh, but you've certainly improved things there. The culture, blah, 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 is better. Um, program could be in much worse hands. I, I agree with you on that on that standpoint. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this, because we'll, we'll probably clip this and make it its own video um, as well, just because I, I think this will do well on YouTube. The other thing is, that, like, I, I think that, I, I don't want to say a ton of people listen to this show, and this is the number one FSU podcast by, by a good margin, but, there's still a whole lot of people in the stands that don't listen. I do know that some of the, the people who are pretty connected listen to the show. And they do listen to the point that we make about the early signing period in that transitional class pretty consistently, which is that it's likely to suck. Now, everybody hates to hear that at the time that we say it. But again, I mean, do you want to do this? Just I, I, If I can run down the whole the whole signing class in, I don't know, less than a, less than a minute, uh, I mean, I'll just say the name. You think, are, are they ever a, a, a starter here? Okay. Damari Tate. Yes. Ooh, okay. Brian Robinson. No. Kevin Purdy, already gone. Brian Robinson, already gone. Green McKnight. No. Go Philly. Well, yes, but yes. Yeah. I think you're going to push him pretty hard. That may be why Corbin went pro. Uh, Doesn't make any sense to me, but I have heard similar. Yeah. Uh, Dix. Uh, not anymore. I mean, yeah, technically a starter last year for some games, but no, never again. Ja'Kai Douglas, I think we agree, no. Corey Wren, no. Portier, I would say no. McCluster, no. Robert Scott already starts. Sidney Williams, maybe. Griffiths is already gone. Schrader, I'm going to say yes. I think we probably agree there. It's got some well, work to do physically. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I did hear good things about him in, in the offseason program already. So good. Uh, maybe that's a 23 guy, maybe not a 22 guy. 
Rodermaker, I quickly know. Williamson, no. Uh, Zane Herring, no. Damian Webb, uh, already gone. Boatwright, no. Lundy, I guess he kind of started last year. Yeah, he's but a starter. He's a starter. Lloyd Willis, I'm going to say no at this point, unless things change. TJ Davis, no. They keep telling me they love Marcus and Douglas, but... I mean, if, if you love a tight end, given how bad your tight ends were last year, you don't think he would have played. Uh, Master Mono, the punter, okay. And uh, and Manny Rogers, obviously, never qualified. So, the guys that listened to the show, I think they understood that the first class that Norvell signed, you probably weren't going to get a whole lot out of, and indeed, you're not. Like, that's a ton of washouts. It's, it's entirely in keeping with the, with the pattern that we've seen with the early signing period. When you hire a coach, a lot of these guys are available for a reason, and it's not a good reason, okay? It's kind of fool's gold. And in next class, unfortunately for him, and I think the power people at FSU understand this and why they're going to exercise some patience, was a COVID class. You didn't get to get anybody on campus, and obviously that was for all of college football. However, you also didn't get to get these guys on campus the year before when they were juniors. So you really are flying blind for another class, for two classes in a row. And again, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot out of that 2021 class which is probably a conversation to have as far as the ultimate upside within the time frame that Orvell is going to have here, especially considering the misses you just had on early signing period. But I think they realize the magnitude of the rebuild and some of the challenges that you're going to face. And that, that's basically all I have to say on that. I really do not believe Mike Norvell's on the hot seat at all, unless they go like three and nine. We're in agreement there. Uh, now, one thing I, 